Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Xu Yang Ling to this One World Mind seminar today. Um, Xu Yang got his PhD at uh, UC Davis under the um, supervision of Thomas Stromer before moving on to uh, Courant as a Courant instructor and then uh, staying with Courant but changing countries to uh, follow a 10 year track career at NYU Shanghai. I think uh, I know him uh, or his work from the early days because I think um, he was, I would say, the one of the one of the main players, if not the main player in sort of the, developing a math mathematical understanding for bilinear problems, which uh, I still find very interesting, but also his more recent works that he will tell us about, I think are very exciting. So uh, Shu Yang, it's a pleasure of having you. And with that, I would also still thank you for being the head organizer of the uh, Asian European uh, slot of this One World Mind seminar. And so keeping this alive. Uh, that was very nice. So it's great to have you. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thanks, Felix, for the introduction. And uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be on the organizing committee uh, for the One Words Mind Seminar, especially in the, in, the, in the context of the COVID. Hopefully, I will see everybody uh, in person soon. Um, so, uh, so today I would I would like to present uh, some of my recent work um, on the generalized orthogonal procrustal problem, and uh, basically the idea is that we develop some non-convex approach to solve it and uh, obtain the global optimality of the solution. <clears throat> so I will first try to uh, describe what this problem is and what's the motivation, why it's interesting. Um, so the generalized orthogonal problem basically it has a couple of application, and one of the important applications uh, in computer vision about uh, the point clouds registration. Um, so here's a, we can see the plot, there's a, um, three bunnies uh, of different, different colors. And, the, <clears throat> and basically they're uh, point clouds. And the, the question here that, uh, how to find uh, like a rigid transform, including uh, translation and reflections and the uh, rotation so that these uh, three bunnies, three uh, point clouds uh, are um, aligned. That's a question. And uh, that's quite an important problem in computer vision, especially if you have different pictures and uh, each picture has a cat and dog and you want to align all these cat and dogs simultaneously. And uh, another important application of this uh, Procrustal problem is in the cryo EM, which is uh, very popular in the ten, uh, past 10 years and even longer time because it's, I think it's one of the fundamental problems in physics and biology and the physics uh, uh, and the chemistry. Okay, so the question is also probably known to many people. Uh, you have a molecule and you want to find out the 3D uh, structure of the molecule but it's too small to, to visualize it. Mm -hmm. uh, so technically what people do is that we freeze it and then we shoot it with light and then we get a diffraction pattern like this. And uh, essentially this molecule, uh, can, you can describe this as uh, some kind of potential function of uh, electricity, okay? Um, and then we see this uh, um, 2D projection of this 3D object, but you don't know the rotation because uh, the molecule probably can rotate in the water when it's, when, when it's free, it's frozen. Mm -hmm. So we get this uh, 2D projection. So technically it's actually line integral and then the question that are how to construct a 3D object from this uh, randomly oriented uh, to the projection of the object. Okay, so I will try to uh, formalize, formalize both of these problems into one single optimization program and uh, try to solve it. Okay, um, so, um, so I will first start with the simplest case for in the point clouds registration that uh, we only have two point clouds. And uh, suppose we have two uh, point clouds, let's say, denoted by two matrices, A1, A2, and each of the uh, column stands for one of the data point, let's say in RD. So we talk about the general case. And the question here that uh, how to find out uh, orthogonal matrix, matrix applied to the second or the first, it's the same thing, as uh, rotated and reflected so that uh, their um, L2 distance is as, as small as possible. Um, so we, we actually, I don't talk about uh, the, uh, the translation or the shift because it's relatively simple because you can always uh, shift uh, all the points uh, to the origin, okay, by do the centering, okay. So we only care about uh, the orthogonal part uh, for now. 
And for this problem, it's actually a standard the exercise in linear algebra that uh, you can just expand it. And using the uh, singular value decomposition, you can easily find out the global optimal so, uh, optimal solution to this, despite it's non-convex. So the O hat the optimal is essentially uh, the left and right singular vectors of the A1, A2. So it's look like uh, the cross covariance matrix of these two point clouds and just do SVD, you get it. But in a lot of applications, instead of you only have two point clouds, you probably would have a, a multiple. For example, you have N of them and N could be large and D would be three, for example, 3D point clouds registration or even higher dimension, okay? And also we have a similar question. So we basically want to find out an orthogonal matrix for associated with each point clouds so that uh, after you apply this orthogonal matrix to this, these point clouds are well aligned, okay? Um, so essentially this problem could be formulated similarly as uh, um, the two point clouds case is that you can, in, this, in, it's equivalent to say that you want to find out a common reference point clouds A. Okay, it's the same one and a rotation OI so that um, the this so that once you apply this OI to A and uh, subtract from the AI, the I's point clouds summed together, this is minimized. But uh, remember that uh, here you have two variables um, OI and A. Okay, and each point cloud has exactly M data points. Okay. So throughout my talk, uh, I will study a, a, a special case is that uh, we believe there's some signal in the data uh, data data point uh, data point clouds because for example it would be cat and cat and dog in these point clouds. So we we uh, assume that each uh, observed point clouds is actually um, some um, underlying structure underlying signal A, but rotated with some unknown orthogonal matrix plus some additive noise, okay? So essentially we treat these as a um, statistical influence problem. Is that uh, they give you AI, okay? We want to find out A and the OI. OI is a orthogonal matrix. So I some, see some questions from the chat. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, so uh, there's a Mark Cohn asked if, is it order of the point clouds given? So yes, here, uh, the order of the point clouds is given. Um, of course, it's a, so that's a great question. If, if the order is not given, actually it's even harder because you would multiply, even for the 2D cases, even you only have two point clouds, it's difficult. For example, here you would multiply a, a permutation matrix and then you min minimize the simultaneous orthogonal transform and a permutation. And then for that problem, it's called a pro cost matching and the, it's related to the quadratic assignment. So it's uh, much harder than the version I presented here. Okay. Can I so also ask a question quickly? And, and namely, uh, so if you go back, uh, mm -hmm. you said that there's this um, OI and, uh, and A. So mm -hmm. um, this, which basically gives you two objectives, but you could also change to just choose A to be A1. Right, because then, like, is there is there from the noise perspective an advantage of having two uh, objectives? Because I mean, if it's if it's if there's an exact representation with no noise, then you could just choose a to be a one, and then all the others would rotate. But yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but what if uh, the the noise is actually uh, quite uh, uh, the, the noise in the point first point clouds is quite uh, large. Uh, because if we only fix the reference, that means uh, the structure is basically, uh, it's like a tree. But if we uh, fix A as a, like a common point cloud, so it's actually, um, we like integrate all the pairwise information. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's probably one of the explanation for, for the motivation okay. of using the common point cloud, but we don't know yet. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. okay, Um. so, um, so now let's try to uh, do some uh, simple algebra and see how, how how to solve this problem. Um, for example, here, because we have two um, variable, uh, so one way we can do that, uh, suppose we are given OI and we want to find our global minimizer uh, respect to the variable A. Now, this is actually quite simple because it's actually convex respect to A and, uh, and uh, try to solve it, basically just do this as a sample average, okay? Um, then uh, essentially, if you plug in a hat into this objective function and do some algebra, um, this objective function is actually equivalent to say the following. 
Um, so you are maximizing over uh, OI transpose AI, OJ transpose AJ. Um, so that's actually the alignment between I and J. And they take the summation. And if we rewrite it, that's basically uh, a, AI AJ. That's a, I call it uh, cross covariance and OI OJ. Okay. So it's look like a quadratic form. Okay, but here the op, the the feasible set is a, a set of uh, orthogonal matrices. Okay, so that then we land the uh, uh, arrive at final arrive at the orthogonal process problem. So general it looks like uh, this type of format. Um, so we have a, a, a CIJ is given, and then we want to maximize this uh, over these orthogonal matrices, and it has been studied extensively in optimization community, also in uh, uh, imaging processing. And for example, um, for this CIJ uh, in the two application mentioned uh, in point cloud registration, this would be the cross covariance. And uh, in CIJ in the crowd EM, it would related to the common line of uh, of the data. Basically, it's uh, um, the the um, we if if we have a projection of the some three D object line integral in a certain direction, if we take the Fourier transform, we actually look at the object the Fourier transform at a particular plane. And if you have two different viewing angle, they actually have a um, common line because the unfrequency plane, they have a two plane and the intersection would be in line. And then basically we want to find our rotation so that the, the corresponding line are maximized, the co correlations maximized. Okay, so finally we'll end up with this optimization program. We want to solve it. Uh, but is this easy to solve? Um, actually, it's not because it's a um, an quite a famous MP hard problem. Uh, for example, even if uh, here D is equal to one, which means it's correspond to the binary case, it's MP hard problem. For example, graph max max cups would be a, a typical example. Um, but on the other hand, if we uh, uh, this uh, MP hardness is actually related to the um, signal to noise ratio especially currently for example in, in computational modeling analysis and also in data analysis the community people believe that uh, the, the seemingly mp hardiness is depends on the noise so for example if we consider the case when there's no noise at all uh, which means uh, there's no additive noise uh, or is um, the ground truth and then if we, if we want to try to find out uh, the global optimal solution of the ProQuest problem, we find that the ground truth is exactly the global optimal. So this is actually a trivial case. Um, so, but, and then if we add the noise a little bit more, okay, then we think about whether we can solve it again, uh, find out the global optimal. Um, so in fact, uh, in a lot of uh, this type of problem, um, if there's more signals or the signal is much stronger than the noise, in fact, it becomes less challenging, which means that even if it's seemingly mp harder, you can still find out global optimal. So uh, here we leads, this leads to uh, fundamental questions that currently in information theory and the statistics that are computation is that how the solvability depends on the SNR, the signal to noise ratio. So here, when I say the solvability depends on the statistical performance, is that uh, uh, when we solve this problem, how the MLE uh, is close to the ground truth or the population parameter, and also the computational complexity. We want to find out efficient algorithm of a polynomial complexity algorithm instead of a um, quite a computational heavy algorithm. And the, the observation that if the signal to noise ratio is very low, it actually makes the influence problem very challenging. But on the other hand, if the signal is strong, it's uh, more favorable. So the question is actually try to explore uh, this uh, threshold for the statistical and computational threshold so that uh, we can identify a certain regime uh, for the SNR, uh, which enable us to solve it completely. Okay. So uh, in order to do that, um, we I will try to int introduce a couple methods to do it. The first way is using the so-called convex relaxation. It's quite the well known. Um, so if I want to do this, essentially I would rewrite this objective function by um, making the orthogonal matrix into a large orthogonal matrix. So it's an ND by D matrix, each block is orthogonal, and the C is a data matrix. And uh, for the relaxation, essentially we want to um, make it into a convex program, approximate this, uh, this uh, original non-convex program into a convex program. And the idea that we let OO transpose, okay, as one treated as one variable. And the, the uh, advantage is that uh, this becomes linear in this uh, lifted case. 
Okay. Um, so then if we let this as a one variable, we realize that this is a process time definite. And also the diagonal blocks are identity. Okay. So that's the advantage. And then we finally arrive at one of the relaxation. It's also well-known relaxation um, by solving this SDP, the semi-definite programming. Okay, so this is essentially the generalization of the uh, Gomez Williams relaxation for the graph cut, but we generalize to the block case. And for this program, of course, we have a, a off the shelf, uh, for example, interior point methods to solve it. Um, but despite the computational complexity, it could be quite high, uh, but it's, it's a, at least a polynomial solver. And uh, since we relaxed it, it's naturally that. Uh, basically the physical set gets large. So we expect that maybe the solution of this SDP uh, may not be uh, the same as the global maximized to the original program. So in a lot of application actually would like to do the rounding, uh, do some kind of spectral methods and then round each block into a orthogonal matrix. But here we will talk about a, a different scenario is that a, a, about a tightness is that sometime despite we don't know do, do the rounding, do, uh, actually do the SDP relaxation and solve it will they exactly give us the optimal solution to the, of the original program. So when I say that, and it basically means um, solving this the original program, this, uh, uh, solving this SDP relaxation will give you a solution which is exactly rank D. Because if it's rank D, it means it's actually a feasible solution of the original program, and it definitely will be the global maximizer to the original program. Okay, So is that true? So we will try to look at um, like a benchmark statistical model um, by uh, introducing some uh, noise to it. So here I'll introduce this model is that we have a like, a, it's essentially a, a, like an underlying point clouds we don't know. And we have a orthogonal matrix uh, unknown, but the, it's a random orthogonal matrix and the, as some Gaussian noise and the sigma will control the signal to noise ratio. So the idea that we observe these uh, noisy data um, corrupted by Gaussian noise and want to reconstruct the orthogonal matrix and the also underlying point clouds. Okay. And then let's see how the tightness, how the STP relaxation um, that tightness will actually depends on the sigma, the SNR. And the, here's a, as a point, uh, actually the uh, phase transition plot. So I, prop, I properly rescale it. Uh, so uh, it's uh, we we will talk about we'll return to this scaling later, uh, but uh, this here the point is that uh, here I fix some parameter. For example, each point cloud has uh, twenty five points in dimension five, and the total number of point clouds is a uh, uh, one hundred to one thousand. And we just run the SDP, and uh, here's what what do we get? We find that um, in this region uh, for for the white region actually it means uh, um, SDP the solution to SDP is is uh, tight. It's exactly equal to is the rank is exactly D, okay. And uh, if the noise gets larger uh, here, it becomes black. It means uh, they are not equal, okay. Um, so um, essentially, this is an interesting problem. Actually, it's not observed the first by me. It's uh, so back in two thousand four, uh, Alfonso Bandera and also Co and Amit Singh. They actually raised this open problem in the uh, general machine learning research. Um, is a is a following paper, and uh, let me restate uh, the this uh, their, their their conjecture. It says the following: um, Suppose that you have a point clouds. Um, it's a d dimension, and it have m point clouds, and uh, m is a uh, larger than d plus one. So this is ensure that uh, this a the smallest eigen singular value is actually non negative, and the sample uniform from some uh, hypercube. Okay, and then you have a Gaussian noise. Then uh, the the conjecture says that there exists some sigma star um, on the noisy level, strength of noisy level, so that uh, if this sigma is below this uh, threshold, the so STP relaxation is actually tight. It means it's able to recover the original, uh, the optimal solution to the original least square with high probability. Um, so then the theoretic question that uh, interested me would be um, how to show the tightness of this SDP uh, and also how to find out the sigma star. The second question that uh, um, whether we can design an efficient and globally convergent algorithm, which is not SDP, uh, can achieve a comparable uh, performance because SDP is quite slow. 
Um, so then I will actually introduce the, the generalized power methods, which would be the keywords in, in, in my slides uh, on the, on the, in the title of my talk. Uh, but in fact, uh, this can be uh, quite nicely motivated from the alternative minimization. Um, they are actually equivalent. Um, so uh, let me um, let's recall this original program. We have two variables to to make uh, to minimize, and uh, if all i is fixed, uh, we know the solution already. And uh, if a is given, also it's quite simple because um, it, you can solve uh, all i separately because each of them actually it's an actual separable function, and uh, if we just do this expansion, then we know that uh, this OI can be done by doing a single value decomposition to this uh, AI and A transpose. Suppose A is given. And I define this uh, matrix sign function is that give you X, you do SD, SVD, and they, we just extract the left and le left and right single vector, multiply them together. So that's called a matrix sign function. And uh, the minimizer to this program when A is fixed is essentially given by this uh, matrix sign function applied to AI A transpose. Okay. So then naturally would you have you would have an algorithm. So suppose at the T iteration we are given O I T. Okay. So that's a uh, iterates at the T iteration. Then we can immediately estimate A T at T iteration by doing this uh, weighted sum. And then the next iteration I will just uh, apply the matrix sign function to each of the AI A T transpose. You get this. So this naturally would become an uh, algorithm. So in order to introduce uh, um, the generalized power methods, I would like to use some, uh, uh, may also make this uh, algorithm more compact to write into a matrix form. I introduce uh, the following notation. So I let the D to be a data matrix. D stands for data matrix. It's uh, essentially just a, a stack all the matri uh, data matrix into one big matrix, and it becomes a ND times N, okay? So each of them is a block. And ST would be the matrix which consists of all of these orthogonal matrix. And the PS is that we project each um, D by D block to orthogonal matrix. And uh, this, since this algorithm is actually non-convex, I also require some initialization. Um, so the initialization is essentially, I just uh, compute the top D, left a single vector of this matrix, uh, and then run the, each block to a solvable matrix. So there's a reason why I would like to do these inter spectral initializations because uh, if there's no noise, essentially the top D left single vector of this data matrix will exactly give you the underlying rotation. Okay, so finally, we actually arrive at a, a generous power methods. Um, so if we rewrite this OI transpose, essentially this would be the iteration, okay? So uh, it can be ni ni nicely written into this uh, a C matrix, data matrix, applied to the previous iteration uh, uh, iterates of orthogonal matrix. Then we do rounding on each block, okay? So um, if I want to summarize it, here's the algorithm, okay? Um, so input is essentially C equal to DD transpose. The CIJ is a cross covariance. Then we compute the top D eigenvectors of C corresponding to the left uh, single, top left singular vector, a uh, singular vector of D do the rounding, then we update um, the iterates by um, doing these uh, project the power methods. Okay, so this is called the power methods because uh, it's quite related to the um, power methods to solve an eigenvalue problem, but here we do the projection at each iteration because we require uh, the output we orthogonal matrix. <laughs> okay. okay, so any questions before I proceed? So I think, it, um, okay. Okay, so the next question becomes uh, how we are able to actually um, analyze this and uh, how, what's the performance of this algorithm? And uh, can we establish some theory for it? Okay, does it work any theory and uh, since it's non-convex? So first, uh, uh, I would like to compare this uh, performance of these uh, generalized power methods with a uh, um, SDP solver, because uh, we are actually choosing a different algorithm. Okay, so I would like to make sure that uh, these two algorithms actually would uh, behave similarly. So here's an example I choose. Um, so I 
choose an ideal example by particularly choosing A, and also the sigma is given like this. So it's a, it's a related to some scaling. Uh, I will talk about this later. But the point is that here, um, I let kappa, which controls the signal to noise ratio, um, gets from small to large. And then uh, for each given kappa, I just run the SDP relaxations and also using a generalized power methods to do it. And then I see how many of them are actually tight. And here's what the plot I get. Okay, so if it's one, it means uh, all of the cases actually are tight. I, I just do like 25 um, instances. And the, uh, for example, here, when kappa is smaller than 0.6, um, is it tight? And then suddenly, um, when the noise gets larger, it decreases to zero. But you see, these two curves are almost the same. Um, and, and which means um, um, the SDP relaxation and the general response methods basically they behave quite similarly. Okay. Um, so naturally, um, there's a, a, a question before I proceed to this a, a theorem. Um, naturally, we'll ask the following question: is about a statistical, statistical threshold, um, because here essentially we have this um, model is a is can be written down as a signal plus a noise uh, version. And there's a natural question that uh, if the noise is too large, essentially this data matrix just purely noise. And if the signal is very small, it's essentially a signal. Um, so this must be some kind of threshold so that if the sigma is too large, probably no matter what methods we can try to use, um, this is not able to produce a, a statistically meaningful solution. And this has been uh, uh, almost as re as resolved in the random matrix community is that it's kind of related to the BPP transition. Is that, um, so here I just using some kind of heuristic. Um, suppose I have this uh, signal part and the noise part, and I just compute the operating norm of both parts. And uh, then I just compare them. And uh, this is uh, the signal strength and this noise strength. So essentially, if sigma times this uh, noise, this is Gaussian matrix, we know the spectral, a uh, largest eigenvalue, a singular value. And if sigma times this, this noisy part, greater than the square root of n times the uh, uh, noise of a. Essentially, it's uh, um, quite hard to difficult, uh, it's almost impossible to get um, a statistical meaningful solution, okay? Um, so this means that we actually try to find out some algorithm which can work close to this threshold up to some constant, okay? Okay, so, um, Here's the first theorem uh, about uh, these, uh, um, our result is uh, first uh, start with a spectral initialization. So you can also think about this as a spectral estimator is basically we just extract the left single vectors and do the rounding as the following. So if we do this uh, procedure and we can produce a, a spectral estimator, then we can obtain a kind of a blockwise error bound on the operating norm. So SI is a solution minus uh, the ground truth and then we introduce an orthogonal matrix because we have to resolve the global ambiguity, maximize it. So it's kind of an L infinity norm, but it's blockwise the L infinity norm on the operating norm. Then we minimize it over, over the orthogonal matrix. Then that's what we get. So sigma is actually the signal to noise ratio, uh, signal, uh, uh, noise level. And if you look at this um, blue part, that's related to the statistical threshold I mentioned. And this uh, red part is actually additional up to some uh, condition number here. So if we ignore this part, the condition number in this, it's uh, nearly optimal, okay? Because uh, uh, we only require sigma is smaller than this um, threshold. Um, it's related to this uh, threshold I just mentioned, okay? Um, so it's uh, also mentioned it's actually a blockwise error for the estimator of the true solution. And then I mentioned I would like to introduce the, the generalized power methods. Is that uh, uh, since here this has already given us a, a statistically near optimal estimator, but the solution is not uh, the solution uh, to the least square or the MLE. So we do the local refinement by using the generalized power methods. So here's what we get. So in order to do that, I introduce um, some notion of a metric. Uh, to measure the convergence of uh, the iterates st. So here I define um, this type of metric. So give you two nd by d matrix. I define the distance by um, module, uh, like a, a 
take a quotient over uh, modular these orthogonal matrix. Okay, so here's what we get. We can show that these generalized power methods, if we do this algorithm, um, if the sigma is smaller than um, this threshold, quite similar to the spectrum method, but you have additional square root of D, the rank of this online matrix, then we can show that uh, um, these iterates will converge to uh, some limiting point as infinity, but we don't have a closer form for it under this metric um, linearly to this um, solution. Okay. And ST is, of course, initialization. And then, um, moreover, this LS infinity is actually global, unique global optimal solution to the original program. And S infinity and S infinity transforms will be the global optimal solution to the SDP relaxation. Okay. So essentially, it says that spectral initialization plus um, this uh, convergence of a generous power method would produce you actually a global kind of a convergence analysis. So this, this theory is quite similar to uh, many of the uh, literature in signal processing, for example, in um, like a phase retrieval uh, matrix compilation, et cetera. And also, uh, so this is a convergence of the MLE, um, the uh, least square estimator. Uh, how about uh, the estimation error of the uh, the also the matrix and also the underlying data matrix? So we have the similar um, convergence, uh, like a, a statistical error. So also near optimal, but here because it's on the forbidden storm, we have a square, a square root of d here. Okay. okay. So numerically, we also find that this is a quite uh, uh, approach to the. Um, st statistical threshold. For example, here uh, we fix the uh, um, n equals 500, which means each point clouds has a uh, 500 data points, and then we let n as a, from 100 to 1,500, and also we choose a sigma to be some at that times the this this the threshold come from the statistical threshold. Then we find that this phase transition for the tightness is also close to the curve we just presented. Okay. So this red curve is essentially uh, the curve, but the constants are quite different. Uh, quite uh, different, but we don't know the constant uh, precisely. I just uh, estimated do some kind of a curve fitting. Okay, and uh, similarly, if I fix uh, the number of point clouds, but let the number of data points in each point clouds change, um, we we see a similar phase transition bound uh, like a boundary um, like this. Okay. So, which means um, this algorithm almost work as what the theorem says, uh, but we have it seems that this this log factor is needed uh, for this algorithm. Okay, but definitely it's possible that uh, if, uh, if uh, above this threshold, despite it's not tight, but um, the solution we obtain they could be quite correlated with the ground truth, but we don't know how to solve it for now. So um, now let me let me try to like uh, make a sum summary of the result and also uh, try to talk about uh, briefly about the theoretic steps we arrive to, we use to arrive at the final solution. Um, so implication that we have global convergence and also the tightness of SDP holds, and uh, related to the theoretic aspects uh, aspects essentially um, we follow the following steps. First, we we show that the spectral initialization um, s zero is close to the ground truth. Um, so to show that, essentially we use some type of Lee one out technique, um, which is recently, uh, in the past uh, five years, it's quite popular to try to show some kind of a, a statistical optimal algorithm. Then what we show that this sequence created by these generalized power methods is essentially a Cauchy sequence and they satisfy this contraction property. So um, the, this uh, kind of a framework is quite similar to the like angular synchronization and orthogonal synchronization. But the difference is that uh, here with data matrix is quite different. So we can show this as Cauchy sequence and that has, has some contraction property. But um, we are not able to show that um, this operator, which has come from the generalized power method is actually a contraction, okay? Uh, we cannot show that. We only show that these sequence are contractive, okay? And uh, the proof uh, basically requires us to construct an auxiliary sequence, um, so STK. So where the STK is actually um, a 
apply uh, generate from the applying the general S power methods to the data matrix DK, where the DK is the same data matrix as D, but you just uh, ignore the case lock, because in the in the convergence analysis we have to show that um, some have to have to do some kind of decoupling, um, because we want to ask we need to estimate the correlation between the um, it rates and also the its correlation with the um, the ice block. So there's statistical dependence in the algorithm. So we introduce this auxiliary uh, sequence to decouple that, to estimate uh, that part. So finally, we can show that these sequences are actually convert to global optimal solution of SD relaxation by verify using the KKT condition. Okay. So that's it, uh, the part for the general S power method on the add additive Gaussian noise. But of course, there's many things that, that is can can be investigated in the future. For example, uh, so far I only talk about the case when the noise is Gaussian. But what if it's a general additive noise? Because uh, um, in the reality, it's uh, very rare that data is actually Gaussian. So the second thing that uh, here in the algorithm actually require the random uh, spectral initialization. Um, but uh, in fact. In the practice, especially in the numerical experiment, I show I we show that even if it's the random initialization, it's still going to work well. So how to justify them? So we have some preliminary results on that, um, but it's highly suboptimal. Uh, there's uh, still a lot of room for improvement. And the um, the the other two questions is that uh, can we um, establish a tightness of SDP without invoking general spontaneity? Because here we're actually using the algorithm to show the tightness. But is it possible to do that without using the SDP, uh, without using the generous power methods? And also, um, can we establish a tightness or um, global convergence um, using other type of first order methods? So these are some questions that we can study. And the, I will first try to give some uh, um, answer for the first two questions. So what if we have general, a general additive noise? Okay, for example, here we add some additive noise as delta i, which is not Gaussian. And then we run this um, algorithm again, we'll try to find out the least square estimator. Uh, is this still work? Does the tightness still hold? And we have an algorithm for it, um, just to follow the same idea using generalized power methods. And um, indeed, we can show some tightness, but the condition is, um, is weaker uh, because of, um, but it's deterministic shows that the following. So if the additive noise of each block, delta i, the operating norm, is smaller than essentially the, um, the, the signal strength, A, um, also have some condition number, then we show that, um, in fact, the spectral initialization, as the algorithm the same, um, can produce a solution quite close to ground truth. And then these uh, generous power methods is able to converge to con converge to a limiting point on the same metric I defined before, so df, and uh, also this is a global optimal to the original least square nonlinear least square and uh, SDP relaxation. But remember here, in central you see that this uh, constraint on the noise does not depend on n; it only depends on um, each block, the noise and signal level. So we don't actually take advantage of. Uh, the fact that all of them are actually can intact, we can integrate the information. Um, but uh, this uh, uh, suboptimal result also come um, with uh, uh, some kind of a convenience of uh, analyze it, because uh, if we we can actually show that um, if we under these in under the result we have showed uh, under the condition uh, assumption I just mentioned, and also within this uh, neighborhood close to the ground truth. Okay, so it's a set close to the original solution, uh, ground truth, um, under some uh, under the distance and the restrict on the orthogonal matrix. Then we can show that, in fact, under this condition, on um, this uh, operation, which is uh, comes from comes at the uh, appears in the general power methods, actually contraction mapping, um, in the neighborhood. And also, it's a self to self, and uh, in addition. Since this is a complete uh, metric space on this metric, then we can just simply use the Banach contraction mapping theorem to show uh, the global convergence. Oh, I should say the local convergence because we require the um, spectral initialization. But as I said, um, this is about optimal because um, in empirically we observe this algorithm can work much better for uh, um, over a lot of uh, other type of uh, statistical model. 
And the second question is about uh, the whether spectral, spectral initialization is needed or not. Um, so, so recall the original program. Um, so in order to study the optim optimization landscape, we do not study the original program because uh, here the orthogonal matrix, uh, it has two connected components, branch, the determinant of one or negative one. So, so in order to study the landscape, we actually relax it a little bit using the Broom and Terror factorization by replace each orthogonal matrix using an element on the Stiefel manifold. Because if D is greater than D plus one, essentially this becomes a past connected manifold. Uh, so that, that means if, if we have started from any initialization, move it continuously, uh, it can move to, it can reach any points on the manifold. But if uh, for orthogonal matrix, not gonna be true. And so here we actually, uh, so Steve, this relaxation essentially, we just introduce a, a, a few more columns for this orthogonal matrix and then you show that each row of this matrix is orthogonal. Okay. Um, then essentially we just replace it with OI by using SI and then we obtain, finally obtain this uh, program. And this P um, actually control the degree of freedom. For example, P, if, if P is uh, exactly equal to D, this will return to the original convex program. And if P is ND, this becomes the original SDP program, okay? So here's a trade-off. Um, uh, for small P, it's very efficient and scalable, and, but uh, of course it's non-convex. So we want to find out a small P, but the landscape is, is good. But in practice, as I said, random initialization work, even for the, um, for the also just running the algorithm on the orthogonal matrix. But here, in order to understand landscape, we introduce the broom material factorization, but it works quite, quite well, as I, I will show the experiment later. And uh, theory-wise, uh, there's a general theorem saying that if, if degree of freedom, P, um, in the parameter is approximately greater than a square root of a two times the nd, in fact, there's no superior to the second order critical point. But in fact, if there's no noise at all, we can also show that uh, the landscape is benign, which means that the global optimal solution, to the global uh, optimal of the original program is actually unique. And also there's no other second order critical point. Okay, so that's something we want to understand. So numerically, we observe it's fine, because if you just run Burm and Terra factorization, we show that uh, um, as long as the signal to noise ratio is small, uh, the landscape is benign. It's it, it does not stuck at, uh, I should not say it's benign, at least we do not observe it gets stuck at local minimum, because it's able to achieve um, the global optimal solution. But the question that, uh, uh, can we establish some theory for it? Um, so here, I will just, uh, the original version is quite complicated and there's too much notation. So I will introduce a simple version when it's applied to the Gaussian case. And so here I just introduce a normal error model. Um, so here I just assume OI is an uh, um, identity and then you have this uh, additive noise. And then we can show that if, if the degree of freedom P is greater than 2D plus one, uh, then all the second order critical point um, of the burn and through factorization is actually um, global, which means they are global optimal with rank D. It means it's tight. As long as the signal to noise ratio signal, uh, the uh, noise level is sufficiently small. So if we compare this, uh, uh, so essentially um, this uh, square root of D plus square root of M is actually the, the strength of Gaussian noise. So this result is similar to the one I just presented for the general noise, okay? So this result, original result holds for general noise. And it, it's similar, so which means on the similar result as a um, general supermax sense and also the SDP relaxation, um, the landscape has also been done. Okay. Um, but we conjecture that uh, um, on the Gaussian noise, um, the landscape is benign, even on the same assumption as the, the version we pre prevented, uh, presented in the general spawn methods, but we don't know how to show that. This is a quite a major open problem in the area. Okay, so I will just uh, uh, end earlier. Um, so we just basically show these uh, general spawn methods and also the convex relaxation of the general orthogonal forecast problem. Um, we show some of the theoretical results, the tightness and also the global convergence 
and there's still many problems which can be solved in the future. Okay, so thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Other questions? We already had a question during the, the, the talk. Please just feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, let me start. Um, and namely about this, this uh, result, suboptimal results that um, you had for the noise dependence, like for adversarial noise here in, in the, like you uh, said. For that, the general noise, right? Yeah, for general noise, yes. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, uh, when you're just making these assumptions, uh, you are not assuming anything about you're just assuming that some sort of deterministic constraint in some senses you're not assuming yeah. that there's any type of randomness in this right, right 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 yeah so the advantage is that it's a deterministic noise so it's up right. it's able to apply to arbitrary noise yes right but the point is i mean you could also rephrase it as adversarial noise right so mm -hmm. in this this would allow so under this constraint so the adversary to choose the noise um in any in 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 the the most harmful way right yes yes and um i just uh, i'm just wondering because uh, you you said you but the experiments you were running were probably not with this adversarial approach but with yes uh, some like more difficult types of randomness but still following a random distribution right? yes yes that's actually the drawback limitation of the experiment right right oh no i'm just just asking because because for this uh, blind deconvolution case, my student Dominic and I, we have this, this paper some years ago where we show that actually in the worst case, the, the, mm -hmm. the dimension of scaling can be much much worse than, than like in the adversarial case can be much worse than in the random case. Uh, so, that, uh, so, uh, so the geometry of the uh, convex, uh, uh, the blind deconvolution matrix complexion, is that, is that yes. the paper you're referring to? Yes. Oh. And and then so because that's that's basically and so that's why I was wondering if if you maybe there could be something similar here as well so that in some sense like the experiments all work very nicely but mm -hmm. because the like the data dependent adversarial noise that you can put in order to mm -hmm. have such a maximal the uh, maximal harm uh, mm -hmm. can sort of uh, be a justification of this suboptimal behavior. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about these uh, carefully, but I definitely believe it's a it's an interesting direction to to find out, for example, very bad examples. Yeah, um, yeah. So actually, the first thing I probably can can do is that uh, if uh, it's uh, over these uh, assumptions, <laughs> can we find out some bad examples? Yeah. Mm. So and, and the, the nice the nice thing is sort of. These bad examples, yeah. In in, the, in your case, so you can, um, you can choose everything, right? You can choose a, you can choose o i, and yeah. you can choose delta, mm -hmm. and everything could be sort of aligned in the worst way, right? Yeah, but it's very interesting. So, yeah. I was just wondering if you had thought about this, but that's uh, oh, yeah. I will. I probably Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Oh, okay, I'll read your, read your paper and uh, probably again uh, and uh, see if if there's uh, any way to overcome this uh, issue. Yes. Mm. Yeah, it's in, in, and the interesting thing is that this is, this is the paper is, is sort of using the, the convex structure, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. that would be sort of for this a uh, convex approach so i don't know right right but if, here, if, uh, here. if it's for like non-convex case so would that be a problem um, i don't know yeah okay that's so, a good point yes there's another question in the chat namely yeah. if the speaker wei jun yin is uh, is asking if the speaker oh, share the, share slides. The slides yes uh, i can i can send you the slides uh, you just uh, send me an email if you want yes. yeah. okay. Okay. So are there more questions? I have another one, which is maybe a bit more far-fetched. So if you go back to the very, one of the very first slides with the uh, bunnies with the, with the noisy point clouds, 
Uh, uh, which part? I, I didn't uh, hear that. Uh, so here, uh, next, uh, the first, one, one more slide, uh, backwards. This one? Yeah. Uh, to me, it looks like the number of points here in the green cloud is different from the blue and red ones. We, we sort of have a, a completely different type of noise than uh, Gaussian noise. Uh, has there been yes. any work on this case as well? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, here, the, the version I saw is a quite, it's a, it's a, despite it's already challenging, but, um, it, but I think it's a, it's still a toy model. Um, so ideally, I think the, 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 the ideal question here would like, would like to solve the following. We can basically viewing each point cloud as a discrete measure. And uh, we want to basically uh, rotate each measure uh, so that they're on the Russia distance, let's say, uh, they minimized. So this would be, I think, an ultimate problem <laughs> to solve. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I can I can only imagine that that would be extremely yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if, if if we can do that, essentially, um, despite even if it's, uh, for example, um, have different point clouds, it's uh, like a number of data points are different, and they the ordering are not given or are fine because it, we are given we are consider the problem on the in the measure. In the, on the measure set. No. Thank you. But that's a great point. I, I didn't mention that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't have to stop it for now. Yes, then. Another yeah. question? May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, Shuyang, yeah. for your talk. Uh, interesting uh, solutions and uh, your problem uh, taking care of this uh, non Gaussian. Uh, that's what's in very interesting. Uh, have you done some experiment based on the mm -hmm. Langosian? Oh, what kind of Langosian did you use? Um, so here, uh, what I, I informally do the following type of example. Uh, for example, um, here I can show I can show some example. Um, the, the, so this type of this type of so um, let me, let me give the model. Probably it's easier to do it. Uh, this model. So um, there's some experiment I do. For example, uh, a uh, the AI and um, probably it can be like a, give you the data matrix. Then we mm -hmm. first rotate it, and then we can randomly corrupt some of the columns of A. Yeah, but so, how? So in a, what kind of random corrupt? So essentially, um, so uh, OIA mm -hmm. the 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 clean data, but in in fact, what you observe AI would be you know, for each column of this clean data, um, mm -hmm. you flip a coin. Um, with a probability, let's say p, it's clean, and with probability one minus p, it's a corrupt. Uh -huh. Okay. Just random. So it's kind of mixture model. Yeah, but you it, you you're still using the white noise, right? In the, your error term. Yeah. So in this case, actually, I can just ignore the error term because uh, okay. that one is in already uh, like a noisy model. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, I'm thinking about this problem, which is very <laughs> interesting that. Uh, non Gaussian, usually you have a depends between the mean and variance. And mm -hmm. then it will be not to be more difficult to interpret the signal to noise level. Mm -hmm. It could be oh, yeah. that your signal increase in the variance increasing as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that uh, your lower signal to noise level doesn't mean that you have a weaker signal. Ah, I see. Because for typically you have, when you have a poor zoom noise, you have this typical phenomenon mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So how do you treat this type of dependence between the uh, mean and the variance that your additive, additive noise, which, which is not actually white. Yeah. I, and then depending on the signal in the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, to be honest, I haven't think about it, uh, but mm. uh, the approach I probably would take is that, uh, um, uh, for example, you're referring to Poisson noise. Uh, the way I would like to do is uh, probably instead of using like a least square, I would just write down the um, MLE and then try to, for, that, for example, first derive uh, the statistical lower bound for the recovery, and then try to try different algorithm to see if um, certain algorithm may able to perform well on this model mm. and then establish some uh, guarantees. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, but I think the status of noise, the uh, uh, SNR in that case, would heavily depends on distribution, right? The, no, no, the yeah, sure. Noise. That's that's the underlying difficulty yeah, the, there. Right, right, the noise model. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because here when I say the near optimal, also it's only referring to the Gaussian noise because in general yeah. noise mm. we actually don't know uh, what will be the detection threshold. It's it's quite it could be quite tricky to find in general. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's always uh, starting with the uh, white Gaussian. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Start with Gaussian. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for the question. Thanks. Are there any more questions? If not, uh, let's thank Shu Yang again for this inspiring talk. Okay, thanks, uh, Felix, and thanks uh, everyone for your attention. It was uh, like very interesting developments. So let's. Uh, yeah, hope that I agree with you that it would be very nice if we in the in the next years we should we have the chance to be in person again. Right. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but still, it was very nice uh, to yeah. have the virtual pitch here from you about your current research. So um, yes, uh, we will. Um, then I would suggest we close the session for today, and uh, we will see each other in three weeks in this slot and of course uh, for those of you whose time zone matches you can also watch the talks in the american um slot that's happening in the next weeks so have a good day see you okay